Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. We're back from Memorial Day. This is Jay Fidel, and uh, here we're doing History Lens. Um, and it's a given Tuesday at 3 p.m. with John Davidan, HBU history professor. And today we're going to talk about something that is really a top of mind these days in terms of current events. But we need to have more context on it because yeah. it's, a, it's part of a much longer continuum. Right. It's getting the context on North Korea. Right, right. John, we need to know the history here, right. and we need to be able to project it forward. We need to make sense out of what's going on. And that includes, of course, North Korea, but it also includes our relations with North Korea, right. such right. as they are. Yeah. And I wonder if you could help us uh, get a handle on, on how we got to where we are. Yeah, yeah, of course. But before we do that, I just want to make a quick announcement, if that's okay, Jay. So I just want to say thank you to all of those, all of those who have uh, watched History Lens this last year. And uh, uh, this is the end of our first season, and we're going to come back next season. with uh, We'll start with uh, an analysis of the history of the Asia-Pacific region and what that means for the United States and uh, in, you know, in the present-day context, and uh, also Donate if you can. If you feel so moved, donate to Think Tech Hawaii, and I assume it's right on the website, right? Yeah, you I second the motion. <laughs> and actually, it's right. unanimous. All right, there so we go. So yes. hide the hence to our website and make a donation. <laughs> All right, so, so anyway, so yes, uh, wow, big topic today, uh, very important topic, of course. On the front burner for the Trump administration and the American people is the question of what happens with North Korea. Uh, with their nuclear program, uh, with their relationship with South Korea, with their relationship with the United States. Uh, this, is a, this is a massive topic for such a small country, a country that in its history has been, you know, it's, it's, it's been peripheral. I okay, say it out bluntly then, it's, it's been peripheral in terms of its international relations to the rest of the world. Uh, what we find when we look at North Korea historically is that it's been dominated by big powers, by regional powers like China and then Japan and now uh, the United States and Russia, you know, and the Soviet Union in the, in the post-World War II period and now China and the United States. It, it seems to be this, this place that attracts a lot, of, uh, a lot of the big powers. But of course, the big news today is that the Trump administration Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, is actually going to New York to meet with uh, North Korean advisor uh, Kim, Kim Jong-chol, who is uh, one of the elder statesmen of North Korea. He's the head of the, the Korean Workers' Party. Uh, he's, he's a guy who has been very involved in inter-Korean relations. He's apparently a blunt speaker. He's uh, kind of a hardliner. Uh, and apparently he's going to deliver the message to Pompeo that North Korea is not going to negotiate its nuclear weapons. So it's not going to negotiate away its, its, uh, its status as a nuclear weapon power. Uh, but nonetheless, you do have this meeting taking place, and there's some hope that this high-level meeting in New York City will lead to a resumption of the meeting on uh, June 12th in Singapore between Trump and King, Kim Jong-un. June 12th is um, less than two weeks away. It's, it's not it's very going to happen, John. <laughs> well, it could happen. <laughs> but honestly, uh, as to what actually will come out of this meeting, it's, I think it's, uh, you know, it it's, looks pretty dark. It looks pretty dim for any kind of progress on the North Korean-American relationship. And certainly what we understand from the uh, the reports coming out of you know North Korea is that they're they're being very firm on this issue of of uh, nuclear weapons. They're not going to give up their nuclear weapons. It's a strange you know uh, it's a strange history. If, excuse yep. the expression yep. that, by which they got to be a rogue state this way. Right, right. They can't feed their people. Right. They use China to bring food in to feed their people. Um, they have no money, they borrow money, and right. then they steal money. Right. They, they're into stealing money <laughs> yeah. uh, but through various uh, high-tech methodologies. Yeah. Yeah. And they're good at tech, they're good at uh, cyber terrorism yeah. and yeah. hacking and all that. They've yeah. demonstrated that. Um, and I guess they're good at building weapons, or at least mm, spending the money they steal to buy the elements of the weapons from other places, right. like Iran and who right. knows where else. Yeah. Um, and, and there are only 18 million of them. It's not that yeah. many people. Yeah. 
Yeah. They, they occupy yeah. more square footage in the newspapers than they really should be it's, occupying. Yeah, no, that's right. And so, so let's take a look at Korea, the peripheral power uh, in history. And uh, so if we go back to the late 19th century, which is really when the relationship between uh, Korea, at that, at that time it's one unified uh, nation or uh, empire under, under the emperor, uh, uh, King uh, 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 King uh, Kojong, the Kojong dynasty, and um, uh, if we, if we go back to that time period and we look at the situation in North Korea, then North Korea is, pardon me, and then Korea. We look at Korea. Korea is being uh, sought after by well, it's it's under the suzerainty of China, and it has been for some time, for centuries actually. The Chinese have basically dictated the foreign policy uh, of Korea and uh, their closest relationship uh, do domestically is with, uh, with China. The Korean relation Koreans uh, have their closest relationship with China and they also give the most tribute. So, so Korea was a tributary nation to China, which meant that Korea would send money and gifts to China to kind of keep China happy, and, and this was a recognition that China was a superior civilization, that it that exercised a, you know, power over Korea. And they would send tribute three times a year to China, uh, which was very unusual. Most nations in the region would send China tribute once per year. Japan sent China tribute once every three years. So you can see Korea has a this pecking order. That's right. Korea has this special, very tight relationship with China, uh, and uh, really a kind of they're not really independent, especially in terms of foreign policy. So if we look back at the late 19th century, then what you have is a rising Japan. Japan is has modernized, uh, modernized its uh, military, its economy, its politics, and and now it's becoming. Uh, a regional power. And so Japan has interests in Korea that the Chinese don't like. And in fact, the Chinese and the Japanese actually fight a war over Korea in 1894. It's called the First Sino-Japanese War. And the war is actually fought in Korea and in Manchuria. And um, uh, the Japanese win this war uh, quite easily against the Chinese who have a decrepit navy and a, and a weak army at this point. So. So, so Korea is being fought over, but it doesn't control its own destiny in this time period. Uh, of course, the Japanese go on to become the dominant power in Korea. They fight another war in 1904 against the Russians called the Russo-Japanese War. And that's really over northern Korea, over who's going to control Korea and Manchuria. The Japanese win that war as well. And eventually, the Japanese become uh, an imperial power uh, in Korea. They actually take Korea over as a colony, eventually annex Korea in, in 1910. So, um, so all of Korea, north, south, all of it was, was, a, uh, was a territory was a, of Japan. Was a colony of Japan. If, yeah. So, so yes. Yeah, so if we could bring up a picture of a, a Korean from that time, a very important Korean intellectual, uh, his name, this, this guy's name is Yun Chi Ho. Yun Chi Ho was actually the son, the illegitimate son of a scholar bureaucrat in Korea uh, from what we would call the Yangban class. This was really kind of the scholar, the literate scholar bureaucrat class in Korea. And uh, uh, Yun Chi Ho is important because Yun Chi Ho became the, the most important intellectual in Korea in the time period between the 1880s and the 1940s. So his time as an important official, he's a young man in the 1880s, he actually goes to the United States, uh, gets a degree at Emory, Emory University in Atlanta, uh, and he comes back to Korea, believes that Korea should become an independent modern nation, okay, and tries to, start a, a club called the Independence Club, and 
tries to push this idea that Korea can determine its own future. And independent of what, Japan? Independent of this, these outside influences Who of always Japan. Have influence and, and that's Korea. right, in yeah. China with its power at the core. And, and remember the uh, whole thing about spheres of influence and about uh, the U.S. and other countries exactly. trying to get a piece of China? Well, I guess they do, do, do the same thing with, with Korea, huh? Yeah, not so much. There wasn't that much interest in Korea among the Western powers. It was really China and Japan who were interested in Korea. China, because historically it had all this influence in Korea, but Japan, because they saw Korea as a pathway onto the continent of Northeast Asia. Ah. So they saw Korea as a place that could simultane simultaneously invite them into Asia, or it could be a sword, a dagger, pointed at the heart of Japan, which was how it was described by Admiral Yama, uh, Yamagata in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. So uh, Japan has this vested interest in what's going on in Korea. Japan supports uh, a Republican government, an overthrow of the monarchy in a Republican government. So does Yun Chi-ho. Uh, Yun Chi-ho has connections in Japan. Uh, there are Japanese intellectuals supporting uh, uh, China, uh, pardon me, Korean rebels in Korea and the situation is quite convoluted, but what's interesting is, so you have Yun Chi Ho and his generation of intellectuals who are really fighting for Korean independence and Korean modernity, and they're allied with Japan. And then you have the court, the king, King Kojong and his court, allied with China. And eventually these two just collide. There's, a, there's an attempted coup in 1885, this results in in, pardon me, 1884, this results in, in both the Chinese and the Japanese sending troops into Korea, and then there's an agreement not to do that again, and then the agreement breaks down and you have the Sino-Japanese War in 1894. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean we, we, we see uh, things happening in the same time, time, time frame in Europe, maybe a little bit off by 10 years ago. Yeah. And it's the same sort of uh, unsettled situation. Yeah, yeah. It's the same right, sort of fragmentation right, right. and well, consolidation. Uh, and uh, speaking of which, we're going to we're going to actually right now, uh, John, okay. we're going to fragment the show. Gonna, <laughs> okay. This is the first part, and in a few short seconds, there'll be the second part. Okay. Because we're going to take a short we're break. Take a break. All right. Hi, I'm Pete McGinnis Mark. And every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me one o'clock on a Monday afternoon to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on Think Tech's Likeable Science Show. Every Friday at 2 p.m., we delve in the magical, magical, fascinating world of science, how science applies to your life, why you should care about science, what impact science has on you and on those around you, why you need to know some science. It's a fun, interesting, painless way to learn some good science that you can use. See you there. Ah, uh, you, you weren't here during the break. You didn't pick <laughs> up some of these points. But it's very interesting. <laughs> You're right. Yun Chi Ho was his name. The Yun Chi Ho, right, right. And, and so he sort of changed his mind there right. as we approached the right. Second World War. What, yeah. what happened? So the interesting thing about Yun Chi Ho is he changes his mind. He becomes enamored of the Japanese is okay with, well, he's okay, it's complicated actually. He actually is put in jail for six years uh, because he's accused of plotting to assassinate the Japanese governor general uh, in, from in 1911 to about 1918. This incident takes place and he's in jail. When he comes out of jail, he converts. He has this, uh, I don't know, an enlightenment, or maybe it's a kind of realistic uh, perspective. Maybe that, it happened in jail. Maybe, it but been a really I, unpleasant time. That, yes, jail, yeah. right. I think the jail time convinced him that he that the, the Koreans really are not going to be able to resist Japanese colonialism, and so he gets on board the Japanese. He uh, he becomes what we call a collaborationist with the Japanese. He supports the Japanese rule in Korea. 
Uh, he believes, I mean, I think there's an argument to be made that the Japanese might be able to modernize Korea uh, outside of Western influence. But meanwhile, they had been very mean to Korea. Oh, well, they, they, and you know, they had been mean a, to China, too. It's, it's a brutal occupation by the Japanese, and it lasts, you know, it lasts 32 years, so it lasts a long time. Uh, and so, uh, but Yun Chiu is interesting because he switches sides like this. And, and uh, he, at, at the end of World War II, uh, Yun Chi Ho, uh, is uh, he still believes in the Japanese kind of the, 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 the Japanese project in the war. He supports Japan in the war against the United States. And so he's st still got this kind of pro-Japanese feeling to him. Um, in the present day, Yun Chi Ho is seen as an evil guy by many mm. because he collaborated with the Japanese. Uh. And there's a very strong anti-Japanese feeling within, within South Korea. Uh, where you can get information about this. And, and Yun Chi Ho is on a list of 90, I think it's 94, or is it 99 uh, people who, who, were, who have been identified as actively collaborating with the Japanese uh, before and during World War II. So, so he's become a kind of infamous guy. What it shows about Korea in the pre-World War II period is that Korea was at the mercy of outside powers. And this is why Yun Chi Ho flipped sides so many times because he, the Korean people could not uh, guide, char, chart their own destiny, and so uh, they they really were they didn't dependent have any upon control outside. at all during that occupation. Not, not, not much. They rebelled a couple of times. The rebellions were uh, 1919 rebellion, which was uh, suppressed savagely by the the Japanese military in Korea. So, so uh, Yun Chiu is an interesting guy, but what happens then is during World War II, of course, the Japanese station a large force of soldiers in Korea and in, in Manchuria because they're worried about invasion from the Soviet Union. There's about a million soldiers up on the border with the Soviet Union, uh, be, between Manchuria and the Soviet Union. Uh, and at the end of the war then, those soldiers melt away the Soviet Union invades Manchuria and then invades Northern Korea at the very end of the war. Oh the United States very rapidly sends troops into South Korea so that they don't, they don't want the Soviet Union to take over the Korean Peninsula. MacArthur. That's right, MacArthur and his, uh, and his colleagues, yes. Yeah. So, so, and what's agreed upon at that point then in August 1945 is that let's, let's divide Korea into a Soviet sphere and a, an American state. Just like Germany. That's in a way, yeah, just like it. So if we could bring up the, the National Geographic map, this is a map that was used by Dean Rusk and Charles Bonesteel, uh, who were on the scene. They were actually in southern Korea, and, and this, trece, tr pardon me, this truce was being negotiated between the Soviet Union and the United States. And they were asked, they were tasked with finding where, where the boundary between North and South would be. They looked at this map and they thought, you know what, the 38th parallel is basically in the middle of Korea. It's that line right below Korea Chosen, you see that? It's the, that line of, la line of latitude there, that's the 38th parallel. And, and the capital of Korea, Seoul, was in the South. And so they thought, okay, let's divide things at the 38th parallel. That became the basis for... Don't you love these meetings with these guys who have no real familiarity with the place or the people or the culture yeah. or even the geography yeah. do maps that way? Right, and, right. you know, when you think back to historically, to all these meetings where people, you know, divided the pie this yeah. way, yeah. they don't usually work, do it they? Doesn't, it doesn't generally work very well. And, of course, what's, what's happened is... Uh, well, what happened after that is so you have a North and a South Korea, a government established in the North that's... A Marxist government, nominally at least, favorable to the Soviet Union, a government in the South that's a democracy, nominally, that's uh, beholden to the United States, with uh, uh, Syng Min Rhee becomes p the first president of South Korea. He's uh, very connected to the elites, uh, political elites in the United States. It's not a democracy at all. He's basically but appointed why, why by the United were we, States. We, we saw it, as everybody else did, as a strategical right. uh, you know, element yeah. in, in, the, in yeah. Asia. But 
Uh, well, we didn't have any history with uh, the South Korea or North Korea. Well, the, the there was tiny... no reason they should like us or yeah. we should like them. Yeah. We had no. The only thing is, we we, we were the, the the conquerors of Japan, right? Right. And they had right. control over Japan, we, so we we had it as the spoils yeah. of of beating Japan in the yeah. war. Am I right? Yeah, we had a tiny bit of history with with South Korea, missionary history. Mm. There were uh, uh, Presbyterian and Methodist mis uh, American missionaries in, in Korea, and uh, uh, some of these missionaries actually participated in the rebellion of 1919, and then uh, they went back to the United States, disillusioned with the lack of support from Americans against Japan. Uh, so, no, there's not much history there, but there is a little bit of history that's pretty interesting. So, uh, so you have North and South Korea, and they're poised against one another. They hate one another. Both sides agree that uh, the other should be extinguished, and, and so North Koreans want... Right, they're all Koreans. I could never figure that out. Right, right. It's in a deep-seated hatred. No, that's, that's right. I but mean, it's... even in Germany, there was not that kind of hatred. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's part of it's ideological. It's fomented by the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, but part of it is just that both sides want the other to disappear. So the North wants to control all of Korea, and the South, uh, even after the Korean War, says, look, we're not going to sign anything that doesn't allow us to take control over all of Korea. So wow. that's the goal of both, and that becomes a real problem, of course. It's difficult to negotiate <laughs> that issue. Because sure. there's no way to negotiate. Sure, it's like the Israelis, <laughs> where you know right. the, the mission of the Palestinians is to drive them in the sea and right. have them all die, and, right. they, and that hasn't changed. Right. The same thing here; they want the yeah. other guy to go away. That's right. That's but right. where did where did MacArthur come in? I mean, he was he had an argument with Truman. Right. Uh, right. He he wanted to go into North Korea, I that's, guess, that's and, right. and so, vanquish the, right. the so, communists. And, so, spring 1950. Uh, the Soviet Union gives the green light to an invasion by the North of South Korea. Mm. And they actually, uh, they offer tanks. So the Soviet Union is pretty deeply involved in this incursion. Uh, the North has, has tremendous success. They penetrate deeply into South Korea. Uh, the Americans recognize that this is a real problem. Truman recognizes this is a problem and says to MacArthur, do what you can. MacArthur plans and as successfully implements a, a counter attack, wherein he takes troops and goes north, really Incheon area, and, and uh, puts troops in at Incheon. They're way north of the North Korean army by this point. And so North Korea has to very rapidly retreat, otherwise the army will be captured. So then you have this pell-mell retreat where the Americans push the North Koreans right up to the border with China, the Yalu River. The Chinese decide, we can't have this, and so they get involved. They send troops across the border, push the Americans the south. The North Koreans. That's correct. And then the American army is retreating very quickly back <laughs> below the, the 38th parallel. And then you have a stoppage in the fighting. And then you have negotiations, truce negotiations. And if we can bring up the, the map of the DMZ, this is the other. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is the result of the truce negotiations that take place in 1952, 1953, that the DMZ is actually, so it's not quite the 38th parallel. You can see it's kind of a wiggly line. Mm -hmm. And that's what's established in, in, 19, uh, in 1952 as the demarcation between North and South. It, it's a truce. It's not a treaty. Um, you know, so essentially you still have an ongoing war, yeah. simply a truce right. in the, the war. And the U.S. could never really get together with Russia because the Cold War was going on. Right. And this, in right. effect, the continuing hmm, battle, the continuing yeah. war yeah. here was, was because uh, the U.S. and Russia could never make a truce out of no, it. No, I don't think so. It was yeah. really the North and the South. Uh, they were still they, mad at they each could, other. Yeah, they couldn't agree to terms. The North wanted a lot of control over the South. The South wanted a lot of control over the North. And so in the end, what you have is a truce. You don't have a treaty or an agreement. It's, it's a question of... Is either nation really legitimate as it is? Yeah. And this leads to, you know, the you know, you just can't negotiate that kind of an issue. So once again, so so you have a truce that is ongoing to this day, to today. There's no treaty. Uh, North and South are still in a state of war against one another. Yeah. 
Now, the South became a democratic kind of country under the uh, tutelage of the United States. Yeah. The North, however, went the other way. Can you talk about that? Right. So the South became a democracy. It became a very successful economy. If you go to South Korea today, it's an incredibly successful modern nation. It's very impressive, actually, all the things that the South Korean people have been through. Just what that leader wanted back in the 19th century. Right. That's right. Independence. Yun Chi Ho, yes, right. A measure of independence and modernity. Um, is he a hero now? No, remember he's the collaborator <laughs> with the collaborator. Japanese. Okay. So no, he's still he's <laughs> okay. considered to be a bad guy All by right, many okay. many South okay. Koreans. So, in the North, you have this hardline Marxist regime uh, that decides to isolate itself, and so they don't they don't develop economically. They don't develop a lot of political relationships. There's very little information about the North. They suppress the the civil rights, the human rights of their own people. Uh, it's kind of a family uh, kleptocracy. I mean, it's you know, it's like this family business of the of the Kims, uh, and uh, they've been able to maintain with the help power. of Russia. Russia supported them. Uh, the Soviet Union did support them, and then later on, China comes in become, and becomes their main supporter after the Cold War ends. Yes, uh, and you know, the allies of North Korea have found North Korea to be a very bad partner in many ways. Because they don't really pay a lot of attention to what you know, the Soviet Union wanted, what uh, China wants now. They 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 they're kind of a rogue state, in many ways. So and and so so that's the that's the North Korea of today. Um, it's been very difficult to negotiate with. They tend to not keep agreements. Uh, they tend to point fingers a lot. Um, it's uh, they do rogue things. They see yeah. themselves as rogues. Yeah. I mean, I think it's got to be more than just Kim Jong Un and his family. It's got to be the pe all the people around him. They see themselves as the rogues of the world. And so, the, the one question I put to you here yeah. in, in the last of our little series on history lens for right, now right. Uh, is, you know, where 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 does their where does their perception of their image take us? What do they want right. to be when right. they grow up? Right, right, right. How do they see the future no, for this, themselves? This is, it's really hard to know because you don't get good information out of North Korea. Uh, what we do know is is every agreement that's been signed by North Korea, North Korea, they've eventually reneged on on those agreements. So, so that's so the current negotiations that are ongoing between the United States and North Korea are really. I don't think I don't think we can expect much of anything to come out of these negotiations because I don't think North Korea is going to negotiate in good faith. Uh, the other parties, the South, you know, what would be great is if, if at a minimum we could get a peace treaty between the North and the South. That would be marvelous because we still don't have that between the two and the North has treated this, you know, open warfare. Uh, occasionally, they've attacked South Korea openly, uh, and you know, bombed facilities, sunk a ship of of the, of the South Korean military, invaded the Blue House, which is uh, you know, kind of the South Korean version of the White House, uh, built a tunnel underground by which they were going to do a general invasion of South Korea. Uh, so it's it's a fascinating but bizarre place. I visited the DMZ uh, last year and uh, for the second time, and you can go uh, down the tunnel and, and see the, you know, the tunnel. You can look over the DMZ, in which you can see Kaesong, which is a North Korean city. Uh, you, you can see all of this stuff, and it's like, wow, this really, it, it's the same place. It's the Korean Peninsula. But it's divided, it's incredibly divided, and it's a very dangerous place. American military personnel have died in the DMZ for nothing more than cutting down a tree. Uh, so uh, it's, it's the, the, the Kim family and their control over that regime, I think, means that uh, it will continue to, for at least a few more years to be a place that's a rogue regime and very unpredictable. They now are a nuclear armed regime. so. Uh, of course, there is a there is a vested interest on the part of the American people and the Trump administration to actually get some concessions out of the North. But the, the problem is that any concessions they give, I think, are going to be figments. They're, they're not going to be real concessions. So yeah. Yeah. It, but but again, I think what would be great is if 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 the Ameri if American diplomacy could result in the North and the South establishing diplomacy, being able to sign a peace agreement. That would offer a measure of comfort to South Koreans who have lived under 
the threat of invasion from the north for ever since the Korean War. Yeah, and you know, one thing strikes me is that a, a country which is at war with its neighbors now for 70 years in right. a state of war right. um, is, is not a happy place. Yeah. You, yeah. you can't plan for the future. You, right. can't, do, you can't have that right. independence and economic uh, yeah. you know, aspiration. Yeah. Um, and, and furthermore, I think they've made themselves into a kind of sore, a canker yeah. on, on the Okole of, of Asia. <laughs> and, and that's their identity. That's yeah. what they want to be. Yes. That's what they will yeah. continue to yeah. be. Yeah. And I think looking into the future, at least from where we are today, yeah. That's the way it's going to be. I, I think this so. This is really a sad story. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, John. You bet, Jay. We'll come back. We'll do more sad stories later, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, bet. we're going to do some happier stories. All right, happier yes. stories in the next fall. time. Yes. John David Come Andy. back Speaking in the fall. History. We'll do happier stories. Okay. okay.